it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Jeffrey White. He's the director of the Office of Cancer and Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the National Cancer Institute. So, so he's right down the street and we're very pleased to uh, welcome him this morning to talk about this area. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and and speak with you. I've never uh, had, had that pleasure before to, to meet with this organization. Um, and as I'll point out, one of our activities is, uh, of my office is to try to, to do some outreach to learn about information needs um, uh, from groups like yours. So, um, <clears throat> so just an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, basically. I uh, have some general comments about complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, some things about the status of uh, CAM, I'll use the acronym CAM, research that's NCI funded, and then some uh, a little bit about information resources for complementary and alternative medicine, and um, something about clinical trials, and uh, aspects of exploring practice of uh, CAM uh, with regard to cancer, and then uh, some comments about low risk interventions, and then a summary. Um, and I'll try to do all that in a relatively uh, short time uh, so that at least we have some time for questions. I'm particularly interested in what your questions are. So most of you, many of you may know that complementary and alternative medicine has a, a kind of fairly uh, weak definition. It's a negative definition of what it's not. It's uh, medical healthcare practices that are not part of an integral part of uh, conventional Western medicine is the is the most uh, commonly used definition in the United States. And the World Health Organization has a similar one, but it puts it in the context of the country uh, that is being, uh, that it's under consideration, so that it's, that they're, it's not part of a country's own tradition and are not integrated into the dominant healthcare system in that country. Um, so we basically break down uh, uh, complementary and alternative medicine into a, ca a series of categories. Uh, to be more specific about what we're talking about. And so the first one is alternative medical systems, such as traditional Chinese medicine or, or Western systems of uh, medicine, like uh, homeopathy is a whole system of medicine. And um, energy therapies, which are predominantly, people think about the so-called, what I call theoretical energies, so the things that come from often West, um, Eastern uh, medicine or Eastern philosophies, such as uh, Qigong, which I see you have uh, represented here at your meeting, the Reiki. Uh, and then exercise, um, if you know the uh, NCCAM classifications of these uh, domains, you, you'll see that ours are a little bit different. Exercise we break out as a specific area. Um, and then manipulative and body-based therapies, mind-body interventions like hypnosis and imagery, and nutritional therapeutics, so diet modifications or other dietary supplement uh, usage, and pharmacological and biologically based therapies, uh, which I think a big category there is botanicals. And uh, spirituality and spiritual healing, again, we break that out from the uh, mind-body group, which, um, is the, um, which other groups may have it lumped in there, and then a miscellaneous category. <clears throat> and then the term complementary is generally uh, thought of as uh, approaches that are used in combination with conventional medicine and alternative approaches used um, uh, instead of conventional medicine. And just some things about the, just the term, the integrated term or the combined term of complementary and alternative medicine. It's a very complex, uh, I'd say poorly defined hodgepodge of ideas and practices with varying levels of acceptance by uh, different uh, segments of the society. So in a lot of ways it's very difficult to talk about it as a field because it's so many different things uh, that many of, many of them don't have any real uh, association with, with each other. Now, there's this tension between the two terms of complementary and alternative, and, and some people are very resistant to the term of alternative uh, um, and viewing it as uh, uniformly negative. And in, uh, actually, in much of Europe, the, the term CAM is really not used. It's more complementary medicine. Alternative medicine is, is rarely used as a, as a descriptor of the area. And I think, in part, this uh, field, is there, there's some 
there's some clashes between a, what I call culture clashes between practitioners and researchers. And so the, it, that's not just really unique to uh, CAM, but it's, it's, it's um, amplified, I think, because of the topic. Um, and often, because CAM is dominated in practice by practitioners often who are not researchers, and, um, but now researchers are coming into the field, and there's some issues in communication between these two groups. Uh, just again to keep on a little bit on the topic that uh, CAM is not uniformly viewed as a, a positive phenomenon by, you know, throughout the society. There are groups that have um, expressed concerns about even CAM research. Uh, even, uh, and for example, uh, here's two, I, give, I just gave two examples, Quick, uh, Quack Watch and a, a website called Science Based Medicine. And these are some of the concerns that they, that they express on um, their websites or in their uh, literature. One is about the low plausibility or pseudoscience. Again, a lot of this is really predominantly focused on the alternative medicine side of it, but anyway, these are what they uh, have their concerns about. Poor quality of the research, concerns that um, complementary and alternative medicine research may distract from more promising topics that are um, in the conventional realm. Um, have concerns that it legitimizes uh, unscientific and ineffective therapies. And also have concern that um, negative findings from research may not uh, eliminate the use of uh, ineffective uh, therapies. Um, <clears throat> these are the concerns about research, the concerns about CAM practice, and some of them are that it's not evidence-based, that it's exaggerated potential for benefit, and it sometimes delays patients from receiving conventional therapy. So this is just, but there's a, what I call a bright side. The bright side is that, to me, is that there's more interest among researchers and practitioners in the field as, as a whole. And I'll show you some uh, things about that. There's more NIH-funded research in this topic than uh, that has grown up over the past several years. And more research results are being published in high-quality uh, journals, uh, in um, uh, medical journals. And there's more dialogue between healthcare practitioners and patients about these topics. Uh, however, this uh, bright side is really mostly about complementary medicine and not so much about alternative approaches. So this is just a picture of part of the NIH campus out in Bethesda. Um, I'm focusing on the clinical center uh, there in um, the National Cancer Institute, where I'm from, is, uh, you know, is throughout the campus and off the campus. My office is actually off campus. But just to give you some kind of a, a picture of the NIH, NIH is, um, I guess, nearly now 30 um, different institutes and centers uh, that uh, make up the NIH uh, as a whole. And um, our office in the National Cancer Institute is about uh, 12 uh, and a half years old, and I'm the director. And uh, these are our program areas, which I'll tell you some about each of them. And our mission is to improve the quality of care of cancer patients as well as those at risk for cancer and those recovering from cancer treatment by uh, contributing to the advancement of evidence-based CAM practice. I'm sorry, I'm favoring one side. I know that many of you are looking over here. Um, uh, the, the sciences that support it and the availability of high quality information for uh, healthcare community researchers and the general public. Um, so I mentioned that I would say something about our, int our interest in trying to gather information, and we are uh, trying to do an assessment of uh, cancer patients' needs uh, for CAM information, and these are the goals that we have. And basically what we've tried to do is to, uh, we started with um, going to uh, healthcare practitioners that are information resources in, their can in the cancer centers that NCI supports and elsewhere to ask them, well, what are the questions that you most commonly get uh, from uh, patients or uh, caregivers about complementary and alternative medicine? We're trying to, uh, uh, to gather some of this together to help us fill in some of the gaps in the information. So anyway, that's something that I, I want your organization to know about and ex express interest to work with you to uh, meet your needs in this topic. Uh, one of the things that we do is every year as we um, report what the NCI uh, is doing in this field, uh, and um, we do it with an annual report uh, that's published online. Uh, you, uh, but now it's exclusively online. We used to make hard copies of it, but you can get to it from our website, my office's website, which is cancer.gov/cam. <clears throat> this is for the 2009 
because um, it takes us, although we're in, we're in fiscal year 2011, it takes us a while to compile this information. And it, give, it gives you a breakdown of a variety of different things, uh, highlighting some of the specific research um, uh, topics. Again, it's across the board in cancer, um, not focused on any disease type. But uh, within it, you will learn about some of the disease type breakdown. But just with regard to how much money the National Cancer Institute's uh, puts towards uh, research and complementary and alternative approaches or some aspect related to that. Uh, annually, it's in the 120, 115 to 120 million dollar range over the past several years. Um, so I just want to direct you to some websites and uh, start with our website, which is, um, as I mentioned, cancer.gov slash CAM. So it's, uh, although it's our website there, and you can find information out about our office uh, by the, from the About Us, it's, it's really about the, and it's about more than just our office. So you can uh, get links to uh, health information from a lot of different resources. Um, um, many of them are government resources, or some of them are um, uh, fact sheets that come from uh, cancer centers. Uh, that are, are on different topics, and I'll show you some related to complementary and alternative medicine. You can find out about clinical trials and programs that we're doing and um, a variety of different things. So I encourage you to take a look at it and see um, what you might find of interest there. Uh, one of the things that it'll link you to is the Medline Plus, which is, um, <coughs> I don't know, did, did any of you, have any of you utilized Medline Plus? If you just show me your hand if you can. Uh, a couple of people, all right. So. I don't know if I did that. Sorry. The, um, so Medline Plus, Medline, Medline is the National Library of Medicine's database of medical literature. And Medline Plus is a, um, a doorway to that that's more user friendly for the uh, general public. And within it, you can, you, know, you can go to these different topics. And you can find in here research that relates to complementary and alternative medicine. And one of the things that I found on it was um, a, uh, a list of herbs and supplements that you can click on and you can get fact sheets and information about a variety of, uh, of quite an extensive list of, of, of herbs and supplements through Medline. Medline Plus. Uh, a little bit about uh, CAM clinical trials and uh, symptom management. I should say that in preparing the, you know, this talk, I you know, try to, yeah, and I'll, I'll come a little bit to some things that are more specific to mesothelioma, but you know, it, it is a topic for which, with regard to complementary and alternative medicine, there's not very much literature that's directly related to it. So we have to pull literature from other areas that, of cancer that might be relevant. So this is some research that was um, funded by the National Cancer Institute, and it's uh, uh, done um, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, and it's about an uh, approach to uh, Tibetan yoga, and it's used for fatigue and sleep in cancer patients. Lorenzo Cohen is the director of the Integrative Medicine Program there, and um, this is some research that uh, that they um, uh, that they performed on uh, lymphoma patients, 39 lymphoma patients that uh, were randomized to the, to receive even t either Tibetan yoga or a weightless control, which basically means that they were not getting, given any kind of intervention, but um, asked for a period of time uh, to not um, make any change in their, in their general, um, uh, uh, you know, not to, not to do the yoga, but after the study was over, then they would be able to start a yoga intervention. And it looked at variety, various parameters of sleep and found that, um, that the patients that were on the uh, Tibetan yoga intervention had uh, consistently uh, uh, looking at these different parameters. Uh, improves sleep quality, sleep duration, late, uh, latency, um, time to go in, going to sleep, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I chose breathlessness as a as sort of a, a uh, symptom or si uh, of uh, that is um, associated with um, many patients with mesothelioma, and to try to look at what kind of literature might be out there that relates to complementary and alternative medicine, and. Um, I found that uh, there is a uh, review, a, a systematic review of the literature that's done by the Cochrane Collaboration, which, is, which does a lot of this kind of work. And uh, basically, this is just a list of a variety of things, but I, 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 I just wanted to point it out because I wanted to look at for acupuncture, because I was aware that there was some research um, 
being used at acupuncture for breathlessness. And um, now, and actually it did find uh, that there were five studies of acupuncture uh, used for the uh, treatment of breathlessness. But it found that they considered it to be a low strength of evidence uh, to support uh, its use. But, there were, um, but that was in part because of um, uh, size of the studies uh, and um, just overall, I think it's predominantly the size. And then also this is beyond just cancer. So when you look at cancer breathlessness, there was only, I think, one study here that was uh, one acupuncture study for uh, cancer breathlessness. But a variety of different things have been looked at. What they found here was um, uh, these, these different approaches of chest wall uh, vibration and uh, neuroelectrical muscle stimulation, which, about which I don't know very much, um, that had high st uh, strength of, uh, of evidence. But just again to show you that there's research that goes on that's relating to complementary and alternative medicine for symptoms that are significant to um, mesothelioma. And um, some of this information is available in, synth in synthesized form from these groups like Cochrane. Um, so I should skip and go ahead to neuropathy. <clears throat> so neuropathy or chemotherapy induced neuropathy. I think many of you know that cisplatin and some other drugs that cause um, damage to the nerves are things that, are, that plague um, many cancer patients. Uh, and there's been a variety of, uh, of approaches that have been looked at to try to prevent uh, this neuropathy. Specifically for cisplatin-induced uh, neuropathy, one of the things that has, has been studied is, has been vitamin E. And um, I think the, the point of this slide is, that, um, is to talk something about, somewhat about, you know, how do you analyze uh, data that are, uh, data sets, I guess, that have, you know, different kinds of uh, outcomes. You have studies that are beneficial and studies that, are, that, show, that show benefit of the intervention, studies that, that don't show benefit. And it's interesting that, um, that these two studies that both showed some improve, or this is actually prevention. So these are patients that are starting the vitamin E at the same time that they start the cisplatin and to try to prevent uh, advanced forms of neuropathy. And uh, this study from Italy and this study from Greece both showed protection against this, um, uh, against neuropathy. Not, you know, not, not absolute protection, but decreased numbers of, of patients getting high levels of toxicity. Uh, and the um, one study from um, the uh, North Central Cancer Treatment Group, which was here in the United States, uh, centered at Mayo Clinic, actually did not show uh, any beneficial effect. I think there's, you know, there's complexities in how you um, evaluate these kinds of things. Uh, one of the things I look at is, uh, uh, is the form of vitamin E that's used, but actually in, in, in all three of these studies, alpha tocopherol is used, which is the most common form of vitamin E that's in, in dietary supplements, although, although there are a lot of other uh, components to vitamin E. But at least there's some um, commonality there although perhaps one of them is a little bit different with this DL formulation of it. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, this was really a, a very negative study. It's, it's not like it was, uh, that it was close to being positive. This was really definitely negative. One of the things that might be is that, that the kinds of chemotherapy that were looked at in this latter study uh, was uh, chemotherapy of cisplatin with taxanes and, and other drugs that cause neuropathy. Whereas in these two studies, they were cisplatin-based chemotherapy, but the other drugs were not um, neurotoxic. So, so there's some, so I'd say that there, although there is some, some data to suggest that vitamin E, and particularly in the alpha tocopherol formulation, um, at doses around 400 milligrams daily, uh, may have some effect on, on um, or in preventing um, uh, cisplatin-induced chemo, um, neuro, neuropathy. There's still some debate about it, but neither one of them showed any um, adverse effects uh, associated with it. And I use that as an example of, of something to, to talk now about clinical trials. How do you find out about clinical trials? And, and um, I chose neuropathy treatment as a topic to try to, where if you, want, if you had an interest in look, if you, looking, where would you find a clinical trial on that? You can go to um, the NCI's uh, clinical trials database, which you can actually access through our website. So that cancer.gov slash cam, you can go to the clinical trials tab there. 
And, uh, and here I found three studies. Two of them were about acupuncture. Uh, so I was really just um, focusing on complementary and alternative medicine trials that um, were um, associated, that were um, for neuropathy treatment. So they're out there. You can find this information. Um, and since um, those two were about acupuncture, I wanted to, um, to uh, again, focus on uh, what NCI is producing with regard to information. And this is the uh, PDQ, is the physician's data query. So this is the NCI's um, uh, liter <coughs> literature review um, program that we do. We have a board, an editorial board that generates summaries of the literature on different complementary and alternative medicine approaches, and this one's on acupuncture. Acupuncture related to um, nausea and vomiting, hot flashes, uh, pain, uh, is all summarized in this one uh, summary, and you can find that on the website as well. So, <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is the portal from our website that shows you the, if you click on that uh, clinical trials, you get to this page and you can pick either uh, a, a certain kind of cancer, um, and actually mesothelioma is, is there, or was when this slide was made anyway, and, um, or a different um, symptom. And at the time, <clears throat> this was back in May that I did this search, there were 330 uh, clinical trials that were related to complementary and alternative medicine that were in the database at the time. And you can, you can, you can cone down on your own area. I did a search then, um, for the Baltimore area, just as an example, uh, and again, on complementary and alternative medicine and um, supportive care, I limited it to, to that and got these uh, three trials that were in Baltimore. So this, uh, just to give you a little familiarity with the database. And now uh, a few things about the, um, uh, this is just sort of, this is just, what NCI is supporting in um, clinical trials of CAM approaches uh, for symptom management you know, this year. And it's just, I just, instead of giving you a whole lot of details, I just give you a condition and an intervention. And so all of this is uh, active uh, clinical trials of curcumin for radiation-induced dermatitis and acupressure for fatigue and so on. And, uh, acupuncture for xerostomia, and a variety of different things for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, acupressure and acupuncture, uh, vasomotor symptoms, uh, post-operative bowel paralysis, and several things on pain, post-operative pain, uh, including some interventions which uh, I was surprised to see. Uh, soy protein as a, as a uh, modality for, for the management of post-operative pain. We actually had the person that was doing this research come and present, uh, give a talk at the uh, NCI uh, about two, three years ago. Uh, sleep disorders that we mentioned earlier, sexual dysfunction, and a variety of things. So these, there are NCI-sponsored trials of all these different interventions. So um, I'm going to tell you about another, one of our programs is called a uh, I'm going to focus here on the NCI Best Case Series program, but that program is managed by one of the programs in my office, the Case Review and Intramural Science program. But this is just to let you know that the National Cancer Institute has certainly been aware of the use of alternative approaches for many years uh, and has been asked to review or to uh, explore the potential uh, value of different approaches over the these over many years and dating back to NCI was started in 1937 and so from the very beginning we uh, we started looking at a variety of different approaches or the institute did I wasn't here at that time and um, uh, these are just some of the things that we looked at different time periods and in the 1990s what developed was an approach called the NCI best case series program and it is an approach that allows anyone to, to provide case, uh, uh, case report information to the NCI about patients with cancer treated with all unconventional cancer therapies with alternative approaches. Um, and uh, we're the only program that's broadly advertised in the world that, that, uh, docu that 
it expresses a willingness to review documentation, <coughs> excuse me, of cases of patients treated with these unconventional approaches. And what we need is actually, I mean, we need you know, real material. We need, we need uh, actual records, medical records on these patients. And after that review, we actually need to review the pathology, slides to confirm diagnosis, radiographic films to confirm response. And what we do this for is to determine if sufficient case report evidence is available to justify NCI-initiated prospective research for specific CAM practices as, CAM, uh, as cancer therapies. But we don't do it. Is, we, there's no intent to make a definitive assessment about the, or statement about the efficacy at, um, of a therapy. It's not an approach to determine whether or not um, vitamin C or something like that is an effective cancer therapy, but we use it as a, a sort of um, a, an early screen to try to identify things that warrant NCI-initiated research. And in the time that I've been doing it, there have been three things that have come through that we th think warrant uh, some investigation Warrant, warrant some uh, further investigation, and they're listed here. Uh, a homeopathic approach actually from uh, India. Uh, insulin potentiation therapy, uh, which, is, um, which is the use of low doses of uh, chemotherapy along with intravenous insulin <coughs> as an approach to try to augment the activity of the chemotherapy. And a macrobiotic lifestyle, which is, which is diet, but is also um, mind-body approaches. So just um, to, to wrap up, I'm going to just mention um, that, uh, and I've mentioned some of these things before, and this is just a group of or some low-risk interventions to consider for different situations, but, but I really want to make a push for dialogue. I think it's, this is the most important thing when I talk to groups like this about complementary and alternative approaches, is though I do think that, you know, certainly patients and family members, uh, um, are interested in what information that they can uh, garner on a, a, on a topic. Um, I think when it comes down to decisions about util, you, the use of an approach, it's very important to do it in collaboration with your healthcare practitioner. So, um, but these are some things that, that for which there is some evidence and that it, it gives a basis for some discussion. Um, some of them are not probably particularly relevant to this situation, but nausea and vomiting, uh, with acupuncture and acupuncture, uh, or acupressure, as I mentioned, uh, prevention of uh, cisplatin-induced uh, neuropathy with vitamin E, as I mentioned before. This one about prevention of cisplatin-induced renal toxicity is really it's, it's interesting to me um, that there's a substantial body of literature about uh, the use of, um, uh, actually, it's intravenous glutathione uh, for the prevention of cisplatin-induced uh, kidney damage. But it is almost exclusively from Europe, and as far as I know, it's been, it, there's been very little uptake in the United States with regard to that. But actually, very little uptake, I'd say, also in Europe with regard to just the general practice of it, um, which is an interesting phenomenon to me, because in, in, in my review of this, um, I cannot find a study that showed that there was some decrease on the effectiveness of cisplatin um, with the use of um, intra, uh, intravenous glutathione. But um, it's, you know, unfortunately, it hasn't made it into uh, uh, made much dent on practice. Um, <clears throat> neuropathy treatment. I mentioned acupuncture. There's, I think I didn't show you, but there's at least one small study suggesting there might be some effect. And there's ongoing research, as I pointed out already. Insomnia with yoga. Um, poor appetite and weight loss. Omega-3 fatty acids and fatigue. Uh, we mentioned the yoga study, but also aerobic exercise. Um, so in summary, and I'd like to then open this up and get, some, get your questions, is that uh, cancer and cam, um, CAM and cancer is a complex field of practice and research, and NCI supports a large portfolio of research in this area. Um, it's uh, good quality information. There, there is good quality information available on this topic. I think you can find a lot of those things from our website. Uh, there may be other, there are certainly other resources that we don't link to perhaps because of some protocol reason that we don't, uh, we are somewhat restrictive in uh, linking to only certain kinds of sites. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about other things. Uh, research is exploring the, um, in, is exploring the potential value of CAM approaches for patients with various cancers. And here are, you know, some approaches that I've already mentioned with potential benefit. Um, and I think that's where I, I left it, and I'm 
I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm very curious to see what it is that you have particular interest in. Excuse me? No. Oh. I have a question about the omega-3 fatty acids. Yes. Do you recommend that for patients who are currently in treatment or patients who've completed treatment? Uh, was there any interference, in other words, with radiation or chemotherapy? I'm not aware of any, any data to suggest that there's any interference with it. And it has been used in patients that uh, are uh, undergoing treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, studies don't get really well designed to look at the interference effects uh, of these kinds of approaches on, on outcomes. But there certainly are, are studies, uh, I'm pretty confident, although I have to go back and look specifically at uh, what kinds of situations in which it's used in combination. One of the things that, is, that, I, have an int that, that I think is interesting and that warrants some investigation is that there's some preclinical data to support that certain kinds of chemotherapies yeah, um, might have some improved activity with uh, certain lipid compositions of the diet. That hasn't been really looked at very much in clinical trials. So I can't say that it would be something that would augment the effectiveness, but I have not seen anything that suggests that it would interfere with chemotherapy. I think they want us to go to the, want you to go to the... Uh, I don't think so because I, I didn't send it in in advance. She's asking if there's if there's slides available, but I'm right. sure we can um, make Alice, them. Alice, all the slides will be available on the website as well. Okay. Um, hi. I think I missed what you said about fatty acid. Uh, the reason it's uh, listed. Yeah. So there have been a lot of studies about omega-3 fatty acids for weight loss and uh, anorexia. And there have been both positive and negative studies. Um, and so I think it's, it falls into this category of similar research to what I was talking about about vitamin E. You can certainly find studies that will go either way on that. But with regard to the issue of is there any evidence that it would uh, interfere with cancer therapy so that you would have a concern to use it in combination, I'm not aware of any, any research like that. Have you heard? <laughs> okay, have you heard of a substance called inositol? Inositol. 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 Yes. And there's a look. There's an inositol and an inositol hexaphosphate. Inositol hexafox, uh, hexaphosphate, which is um, has been looked at. I don't know about inositol itself as a, you know, as a CAM approach, but it's a. This is a. I can't tell you chemically very much about it other than the fact that it, but I can tell you that it has been looked at in some um, animal studies of cancer. And it was, it was promoted actually by um, a doctor at the University of Maryland who had done research with it, uh, with uh, injecting into animal tumors to, to show some, um, some cyto, cyto, uh, cytotoxic effects on tumors. But I don't know if any, uh, there's no clinical trials. Well, I did hear that there was a clinical trial uh, some years ago, but I have not seen any results of it. So all I can say is that, yes, I, I know that there are dietary supplements of that, uh, that, that uh, out there of this. But so far as its use in, in cancer patients, I can't find any, any results of any clinical trials. You mentioned that um, acupuncture is used as a treatment for cisplatin-induced neuropathy. Is acupuncture used to relieve the pain or to reverse the progress of neuropathy? Uh, in those studies, so there's, I think, I'm only really aware of one clinical trial that's reported, but the, I showed you a couple that were ongoing. I think that what they're looking at is um, is actually to improve the uh, the pain scores, so that it's uh, it's more than just to prevent progression. Is actually to induce some uh, improvement. The, the thing about acupuncture research is a very complex research to do because of controls. To to, to uh, because certainly there's um, 
uh, substantial placebo effect, or most likely there is with acupuncture. And so you need to have a, you know, proper controls. And some of these approaches, you need, also need to be sure, I mean, you need to, it'd be nice to have non-treatment uh, control arms in the studies as well, because some of these um, things like neuropathy have their own um, uh, s spontaneous remission rate. So you need to know, you know, you need to be sure that you have a, a good comparator for that. I have two questions. Uh, I'm an NCI patient, and I'm curious, uh, when you go to the website, as you're encouraging us to do, to look at the clinical trials available, are most of your clinical trial patients or participants self-referred, or if they see something that they think may benefit them and they're already undergoing treatment either at NIH, NCI, or another facility across the country, do they, um, you know, approach the uh, investigator of the clinical trial through CAM, or do they go to their oncologist and say, I think I may be qualified for this, would you consider me, would you allow me to participate in a CAM clinical trial while I'm also undergoing the current standard of care for MISO, for example? Um, so how does that work? Because I have gone to your website looking at the clinical trials a few months ago when I was told um, your options are limited, you can no longer have surgery, you no longer qualify for NCI clinical trials. I thought, well, if CAM exists at the facility where I'm being treated, NIH and NCI, why not try an alternative approach? And I'd like to change my diet. I'd like to incorporate exercise or acupuncture or yoga. I'd like to do these things. I'll do anything, of course, to stay alive. You know, how do I get involved in a CAM clinical trial while also continuing with the standard of care, such as local chemo um, back home? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's my perspective is that I'm open-minded. I want to participate in all these things that may benefit me, but you have to fit the criteria for a CAM, CAM clinical trial and then also convince your, for example, NCI oncologist or your, your oncologist, wherever you are, that this may be a benefit to you. I mean, you're, as a patient, you're motivated. You want to survive. You'll do anything to survive. You've seen other and heard about other patients that have survived using change of diet or change of lifestyle, complementary treatments, alternative treatments, homeopathic treatments. Uh, but you have to fit that narrow criteria of the CAM clinical trial, find one that, that pertains to you. And it may not be at NIH or NCI. It could be, for example, at it, MD Anderson or at UAB uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, or in California. But, you know, right. going online, I find places like the Gersten Institute in San Diego where they have the change of diet and lifestyle, mostly the vegan or vegetarian lifestyle, and they say, I'm cured of cancer. I no longer have my tumor because I quit eating meat or animal products. And so I want to know, is CAM using that whole body approach with the change of diet and lifestyle and not just these targeted therapies of yoga or acupuncture. And so how do I find these studies okay. and how, how do I participate? So, yeah, I think, so the first part of your question about um, how do you, you get into a trial and do you need to you know, make the contact yourself or do you need to have your oncologist um, to do that? Uh, I think uh, generally uh, most of the trials are, are looking for a physician to physician um, contact or you know, somewhat medical office to medical office contact. Uh, be in part because um, it's most efficient to get all the information uh, that's necessary to determine if somebody is eligible for the study, and then also to, to see if there might be any contraindication for you know why someone might not be eligible for the study. So, I think if you have an interest in a trial, although you can, <clears throat> I'm sure you can you can do some data gathering on your own by you know contacting sometimes the you know a point of contact for a clinical trial. Ultimately, if you decide that you have an interest in, in determining if you're going to go on a trial, it's best to have your, your physician's office to make the contact. Um, I think some of the rest of your question about you know, um, finding um, sort of trials that have more, uh, that give you access to um, different approaches, like some of the things that you're talking about, diet changes and things like that, certainly there, you'll find that there's, you know, the, although there's 330 trials in that database that I showed you, um, uh, you know, there, there may not be the kind of trials that you're interested in, and there may be 
um, healthcare practitioners that are that make claims about the use of diet modification or whatever, or that even indicate that they have clinical trials. I think I think it's in, uh, it's important that you be aware of sort of the, some of the, the regulations around clinical trials and that the, 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 the terminology of clinical trial need, you get a little bit familiar with and you, you maybe sometimes kind of uh, you know, push a little bit or query healthcare practitioners about what they might call a clinical trial. Is, you, know, how is, you know, how is this really registered? I mean, is, is this an IRB approved clinical trial? Is, 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 there, an, uh, is there any kind of regulatory um, oversight of this study? Because I've certainly heard a, a lot of people talk about in, that they have clinical trials or in their office. But they use this term, I think, in a very loose kind of way. So, uh, but these, all these trials that are on this database um, are registered with this database, which requires certain kinds of um, documentation. And um, not always, though, in, in IND. So that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a FDA oversight of, of all those clinical trials. I think the, most of the ones in this database there are. Good morning. I saw on your uh, previous slide about other studies that had been done in the 80s and 90s. You had Laetril listed there. Right. Do you have anything? Well, Laetril, yes. So that, that's, it, it is, a, from a research point of view, it's sort of a, a topic that died out around that time. Uh, there, I, I can't find any other uh, clinical trials, and we have a um, PDQ summary on Laetril. But I think the last clinical trials on Laetril that, that you'll find in the medical literature, I think, are from the, the late 80s or possibly very early 90s. Um, and although, yes, there were some, um, uh, uh, in, in the trials that were, in, that were NCI supported, there was no activity demonstrated in, uh, with um, uh, Laetril or amygdalin, and there was some toxicity associated with it. Uh, it's certainly still utilized in, uh, you'll find in these, uh, many of these, uh, these uh, centers and uh, these clinics in Mexico or other places that utilize uh, Laetril. And again, if you ask them, I think you have to ask them what, you know, what, is, the doc, what is the evidence that it's based on, and it's not based on any clinical trials data that I'm aware of. <coughs> So I'm very happy to talk with anyone that has questions afterwards. Uh, I'll be around for a few more minutes. But again, thank you very much for this opportunity.